One from the left, that's Terry Bishop, uh, Scott's other brother. And the rest are, uh, are uh, Scott's and the kids. This buck here would be Trevor's first buck, and then the uh, European mount there would be Paige's first buck. Uh, and then the others are, of course, the one in the middle there, the big one, is the is the kind of the exclamation point uh, that was put on this this whole project. So it's uh, a lot of a lot of sentimental value here in that. So it's a uh, it's a it's an emotional day for some of us that got to know Scott and got to spend some time personally with him. Um, for me, it was coming to his Habitat Day tour that he did and then spending a weekend with him uh, in a deer camp in northern Michigan in the middle of the winter in February. How incredibly blessed he was to have a wife like Christy and how somebody so with such beauty could ever pick somebody like him. Well, <laughs> Christy is beautiful. She's as beautiful inside and out. We've had an opportunity to, to learn that. And uh, so, for a lot of us here today, it is a, an emotional day, and we're going to get through it, and we're going to celebrate Scott's life, his passions, and uh, and we're, we're glad that you're here to celebrate him with us. I think all of us, when we really reach down deep, what kind of a, what kind of a legacy are we going to leave when we leave this world and move on to the next? I think this, this gathering today is a very good example of... Uh, what Scott gave to us with his knowledge, but that funeral last August was uh, very powerful and, and said a lot about the man. I'd like everybody to, gentlemen, take your hats off a minute. I'm going to get us started with prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather today. Lord, thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the good weather and the safe travel. Uh, we ask, uh, Lord, for your uh, blessing and, and for us as we leave this place today. Lord, um, open our hearts and our minds. Lord, let us be sponges. Let us be uh, examples of your love in our lives today. Uh, bless the Bishop family today uh, at this emotional time for them. And uh, bless this entire event and bless the food and bless the hands that prepared it today. And we ask all these, son, all these things in your son Christ's name. Amen. You need to go over and leave the Thank you, Tony. I told him we wouldn't be able to get through that. So um, we're next. I don't know how many of you know um, uh, that uh, Scott was a traditional archer. Um, <laughs> archery was very important in his life. We're going to do a salute if the archers could go over into the yard. Everyone draw. So um, this is a family affair. I hope you'll all come up and get to meet the family, but Christy's going to say a few words of welcome to you now. Thank you. Um, the kids and I, along with Scott's brothers and, and mother, want to extend our warm welcome today. We appreciate the outpouring of support from our family, our friends, the local community, and you guys, the community of habitat enthusiasts, hunters, and QDMA members. It's overwhelming and it's it means a lot to the kids and I for sure. Um, Scott had a vision 20 years ago when he purchased an open farm field. A vision many thought was crazy or even impossible, but you couldn't tell Scott anything was impossible. In fact, I think it just made him more determined. So he set out and he meticulously planted over 13,000 seedlings by hand to create his forest. He had shallow water ponds dug, planted native grasses and food plots and created natural deer runs and habitat throughout the entire piece. His habitat <coughs> projects were always on his mind. He continuously searched and researched and dreamed of new things to do or to try back here to make it even better. He was not afraid of hard work and knew it was gonna pay off in the long run. The payoff was greater than I think he ever imagined. He was able to watch the kids and I harvest deer on this land, 
shoot turkeys on Mother's Day in a blind, barely big enough for four, <laughs> and host traditional rabbit hunts with his brothers and his friends. My hope is that I can carry on this legacy for Paige and Trevor, and I truly thank everyone here for the support to do so. I also hope on the tour today you will find your own inspiration to tackle your impossible. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have, um, normally when we have these meetings, we invite some world-class expert. Um, you know, we had Kip Adams on my property last year. We've had uh, a variety of other speakers come from around the country, Dr. Craig Harper. This year, uh, because we're celebrating a pioneer uh, of Michigan habitat, I mean, Scott and um, some other people that are in this room were uh, doing this stuff before anybody ever heard of QDMA and before anybody ever thought you could manage on small properties. So what I'd like to do is we're going to bring up a panel of people and just have an open panel for your questions. And these are all either expert hunters or habitat guys from Michigan. We have uh, Ed Spinazola here. Can you come on up, Ed? And uh, another guy uh, that, um, you know, Scott was a quiet guy who worked for 15, 20 years. I don't know how long on this property toiling on it. And he used to have long conversations on the phone with a guy named Mike Hartges. Mike is going to come up and be on the panel. Mike has created a property. It's a 59-acre property uh, in Hillsdale County. And he, he created uh, a deer wonderland from an open field just like Scott did. So this is Mike Hartges here. We have Bill Vale here, who's the author of the book, Hunting Pressured Trophy Whitetails. His book is uh, for sale back there, and he's donating a uh, portion of the proceeds to Scott's family. Bill is uh, the most expert person I know at setting up stands, uh, how to uh, tactically attack killing big bucks. I think he's probably killed more book bucks than any other hunter in Michigan. Maybe there's another one, but I don't know who it would be. Uh, we were going to have Chad Thalen here. Chad had uh, open heart surgery recently and couldn't make it today. Uh, Chad is a uh, habitat specialist who plants a lot of um, um, native grasses and that sort of thing. But we do have Dan Timmons here. Dan also is a long-term QDMA habitat guy and uh, an old friend of Ed Spinozola's. Am I missing anybody? I'm going to join the crew up here. And what we want to do is just I'm sure you come here loaded with questions. You're going to see one of the most beautiful properties in the state for whitetail habitat. But just want to open this up and we'll pass the mic around and you can ask questions of any of the folks up here you'd like. Well, I just want to say thanks uh, for creating this opportunity for us all to come. My name is George Corum. Uh, I'm Michigan Sportsman in Wago, Georgia. Uh, my question may be for Mr. Stanazola. Um, a question about food plots, brassica, and rotation. I'm not real clear about, are we to rotate our brassica fields because of some sort of fungus, um, or is there a way to manage those fields that you can continue to plant every year? Thank you for the, uh, for the question. First, let me just say thank you all for being here. It's, uh, I'm impressed. And I, I just a little bit, uh, first heard about Scott, uh, I, I'm, I'm Dialing in on the Michigan Bow Hunters Forum. This goes back into the 1990s. And if you ever get on forums, it can be nasty. <laughs> and you know what I mean when I say nasty. <laughs> <laughs> and a voice came across, and it was common sense. Hmm. Scott. Scott B. Okay. Well, as time goes by, you know, just, now it's about 1998, something like that. And I'm, I'm at the Michigan Bow Hunters uh, Rendezvous. I think it was in Harrison, Michigan. Uh, I, there's got to be some Michigan Bow Hunters uh, members here, am I right? Got to be. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and then I seen him again at the Gladwin. You guys moved to Gladwin. And I had a booth right next to him. He introduced himself to me. And I said, I, I know who you are. Common sense. I don't know if he had a mean bone in his body. I, I couldn't see any. So, and I could go on a long time, but I think you know 
what I feel about Scott and what he brought to this world. Now, going back to your question, uh, are you a farmer? Are you, are you planning uh, this brass are going to make all kinds of money? No, I'm a city slicker. I just learned how to plant oh. 20 years ago. If you were a farmer, and I farmed for many, I grew up in a farm in Penn County, Michigan. So I, I got some, I'll prove it. My fingernails are still dirty. If you're farming and, you, and just your life depends on doing it, you better rotate. If you're not a farmer, what the heck do you care? Number one, when it starts to turn bad and you don't know if it's really bad or not, uh, then, then you stop for about two or three years. I have no problem. I plant my brassica for 12 years in the same plot. What do I do? I don't plant it very heavy. Two, three pounds an acre. I plant it with soybeans. I may plant it with corn. And when September 1st comes around, I'll put about 20 pounds of grain, a blend of grain. And I find out that makes a difference. So if you follow that, that procedure, you may see, you may see a, a drop in one year, but it doesn't mean it, it, it's because it's not being rotated. It could be too much water. Brassica, the brassica does not like water, a lot of it. So uh, number one, don't listen to the experts. Thank you. <laughs> being a small property owner, I just wanna, you know, one of the things uh, Ed said, Variety, variety, variety is so important. If you can't, you know, it, it, it can seem real hard that you're going to plant 15 different kinds of seeds, but if you put them all in one bag and plant them, you can usually get some of each thing to come up. And then you find one day uh, you get six inches of snow, and whatever they were eating before that, they're gone. They're somewhere else. So if you have monoculture plots that aren't providing what they need once that snow comes, they're going to be over the neighbor's property. So that's saying something very important there is to not just plant brassicas, but plant five or six or seven different kinds of seeds in that pot. Other questions? Any other comments on food? <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a new DVD, and uh, I'm not advertising it because I know it's gonna sell, but I want you to know a very good portion of, of that DVD is gonna go to you know who. And it's, it's called the ultimate corn-based kill plot. If you bought the round, if you bought a Woods of Water mag magazine, and in this issue, uh, there's about uh, something about how you could fight Mother Nature and uh, stuff like that. Uh, how many here are bow hunters? Uh, it should be more than that. It's only 95 <laughs> percent. What do deer like? on October the 1st. Whoa, wait a minute. Not October 1st. We're not supposed to hunt there October 1st because they're not in the rut yet. How many here believe that you got to wait till October 20th or 25th because that's when they're in the rut, they're moving around. If you go there October 1st to, to the 15th, you're not going to get any action. Have you ever been told that? You want, you want to learn how to beat that? plant what deer like the most, and that is young and green and growing soybeans, not sugar beets, soybeans, but you got to plant them no earlier than July 1. He can take over on this, because I learned this from this, damn, I'll be yeah. damned. <laughs> plant it around the uh, uh, first half of uh, July. And you mix it with uh, something else that could be for cover. How about putting 30 pounds of soybeans with about seven, no more than eight pounds of Roundup Ready corn and plant it together? You've got, you're not going to get any corn, but you've got the cover. Deer are not going to move into your food plot unless they feel secure. Is there anything that makes deer more secure than cover? Now, all together now, say no. No. no, nothing, <coughs> nothing beats corn as cover. I don't care what this man says. <laughs> corn is your answer. You're not going to get any corn, but don't worry about that. That's your that's your cover, and then you can even plant the same thing as travel that's going through there. 
You're going to do this the first part of July. You wait three weeks and you're going to spray Roundup because you plant a Roundup any soybeans and a Roundup any corn together. First half of July. Number two, you're going to now around August the 1st, you're going to just broadcast no more than three pounds of a brassica blend. One month later, July, uh, September 1st, you're going to broadcast again a blend. As Jim Brocker said, when I say a blend, don't plant only oats because somebody said Buck Forage Oats is the best in the world. And I plant Ben Oats around September the 1st. Blend oats, rye, and wheat together, mix it up, and broadcast it. 20 pounds, no more than 30 pounds an acre. And then, September 15th, broadcast 100 pounds of urea. You know what that is? 4600. You've got a kick butt bow sight. Can't beat it. Dan, you got any comments on brassicas? Oh, he don't uh, know nothing. Yeah. Or beans? Yeah, I do. In fact, uh, I never met Scott, but he and I had exchanged private messages on the Michigan Sportsman Forum going back to the very early days of the forum. And, uh, and, uh, he had a lot of the same experiences growing brassicas that I did. Namely, the deer would not eat them. Now, I would maintain that a real good form of cover is early planted brassicas that will grow this tall by hunting season and they'll use it as a bedding area. But then, and so another thing that I use also for my access trails, I want to plant something on my access trails I walk on that I know the deer aren't going to eat, dwarf Essex rape. I have not a fear in the world of a deer chewing on one of those leaves. Now I know that's not, not everyone's experience, but uh, Scott had a, had a lot of the same observations about deer use of brassicas and turnips and rape on, on, on his property. But what Ed was talking about, about soybeans, I found that for my, depending upon how long your growing season is, my property is in Hillsdale County. My sweet spot for planting soybeans is really early July. The best soybean crop I ever had was a year where I planted on the 10th of July, Jake, Jake's birthday. Um, his 50th birthday, come to think of it. But, um, we just had awesome growing conditions that year. And when I say the sweet spot for growing soybeans at my latitude or my growing season, it's late enough so that the soybeans are still green around the 1st of October. They've barely gone yellow if they've gone yellow at all. And also you're growing them long enough so I can still get a crop of soybeans, which are just a superlative late season draw once, uh, once, uh, other, you know, once the corn may have been taken off and you've got the only standing soybeans in the township, and when you get cold weather, they really seem to go for those standing soybeans. And the, and the other tactic that I, that is, is just, that I always employ when I'm growing soybeans is to top them off with some grains, whether they're oats, rye, or that bin run wheat that I, that I like so much, although it's awfully dirty where I buy it. Where, where, where do you get clean bin run wheat? Where do you get clean wheat? Well, the the bin run wheat that I that I use has got a lot of dirt in it, but it, it it's a it's a great accompaniment on those Roundup Ready soys where you've got some exposed dirt and the soys are starting to go yellow and diminishing and yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. Uh, Dan, I'd like to remind you that deer like weeds too. That's very important. A, a lot a lot of weeds are well, I call them forbs, you know. <laughs> you know, it's the it sounds tastier forbs. You know, yeah, right. and uh, I know that uh, yellow rocket, which is kind of an invasive uh, forb, uh, sometimes known as winter crest, it, it's particularly visible this time of year. Those bright yellow flowers. Well, deer will eat that stuff in the in the winter, and it uh, I hate it is a brassica. Uh, yellow yeah, rocket is. It's hard to say. It it is, but I, I <laughs> early in my uh, habitat days, I observed deer eating that stuff in like in like February. So I just want to synopsize something that Ed's taught us for many, many years, and he taught it in his book, is don't listen to farmers. If you listen to farmers, you're planting your grains, you're doing it too late. If you listen to the farmer when he's going to plant his corn and beans, you're doing it too early. We're, we're trying to plant food plots for deer. We're not growing crops and rotating crops and all that sort of thing. So think outside the box. These guys know what they're talking about. They've been doing it a long, long time. 
I also want to say I think Dan Timmons is a bit of a liar because I've seen where deer have eaten brassicas on his property. <laughs> and I have a property just a few miles away and I can't get a turnip to last until mid-December. Rabbits. So, <laughs> do we have other questions? Um, maybe we can get into some other areas of habitat. Yeah. Just real quick on the whole brassica thing. I had the same experience Scott had. My deer just, I mean, if you, if you didn't want deer to go there, you didn't want anything to get ate, plant brassicas. Well, uh, but I never gave up on it. I kept putting them in the, I tried them again the next year. And by the third year, my deer, now, I swear to God, they developed the taste for it. it, it is there such a thing as that happening? Because now my deer readily eat my brassicas, but yep. they did not. And it, it is. Sometimes, though, it can take 50 or 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, your name again is Greg. 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 Deer don't like corn if they never eat corn before in their life. If you if you would go into the woods and you planted corn and they've never had corn, they won't eat it the first year. It's hard to believe, isn't it? The reason I mean, if there was no bait out there. Right. I mean, the brassicas are a, a great choice for something that grows easy, makes a ton of food. So I didn't want to give up on it because what a great resource for a late summer food plot. But if the deer don't eat it, what good is it? Well, by sticking with it, I, my what I'm trying to say is if anybody has a similar experience, try it again the next year. They'll eventually come to it, and once you've got them, it's such an easy thing to grow. And you know, what else would you put in besides wheat or cereal grains that time of year? And think about what uh, Jim Brocker said: variety. When you when you buy any kind of seed, try to buy a blend. Uh, if you can get a brassica blend that's got kale. Do you know what kale is? That's what you eat in the restaurant. If it's not bitter to the deer, they will eat that kale lusciously. The second best thing is, can you say canola? Canola. Ah, I like that accent. And that's what that guy plants now. He plants winter canola. It has less of the toxicity in it because the, the, the Canadian government took regular rape and took out the, uh, I forget, the steric acid or something like that, or I forget the name of the acid that's in it. And now you ladies, you buy canola oil. That's nothing but dwarf Essex rape that's been genetically modified. It took the toxicity out of it. Now you'll find that they will prefer canola over others. Am I right? I'll take your word for it, Ed. <laughs> I, um, I got a bag of canola last year from Dan Timmons. Yeah. He gave me a five-pound bag. He said it was Ed Spinozola's uh, Roundup Ready uh, canola. I planted it, and I sprayed it with Roundup, and it was the last I ever saw of a single leaf of it. So <laughs> I, I think it might have been a practical joke. <laughs> well, ask Ed, what was the deal? Uh, well, I'm sure Ed was selling real uh, a Roundup Ready canola, but it wasn't getting through that way from Dan. So um, there is he just Roundup wanted Ready to see how there, much there, there is such there is Roundup Ready winter canola. He just wanted to see what my budget was for Roundup. <laughs> uh, I I, I want to point out uh, Mike Hart just on the panel here has done what Scott has done, and what you're going to see is taken an empty field. If you have any questions along those lines, he's taken an empty field and created a white tail wonderland. Bill Vale is the best expert on wind and stand setups and that sort of thing. Uh, if you have, you know, if we can, you know, get away from the food and ask, uh, perhaps there's other questions. I have a question for Bill. Yes. Bill, I, I, I got your book and, and I talked to you on the phone, but I never got a chance, I never had the pleasure of meeting you. My question from these people here is, What's the best day to be in the woods this coming fall? <laughs> Does anybody have one of my You're calendars? You're going to hand that back to me within five minutes, Bill. Okay. Uh, the, the best uh, time to be in the woods, the best week, will be the three days prior to uh, the dark period, the day of, and for three days after, in all three months. That will dictate across the board year after year. Um, in the past 20 years of taking white tails with my bow and arrow, I've never shot one outside the time frame that was set for it after I got it figured out. I sell a moon calendar. Am I not quite? I don't know. Okay, I sell a moon calendar, and uh, I wish I could just give them away because they work 
wonderfully in timing the deer. Most guys, when I go to their property to do their property and they want me to help them figure out where to hunt, I uh, um, try to figure them out uh, where to set and everything in all the best spots according to the wind as I see it. And uh, a lot of guys have trouble with that because as you know, um, in my book, I talk about not blowing with the wind in my face, but rather I blow directly at my deer. This has caused a huge controversy as far as uh, tactical, uh, you know, hey, how are you killing deer if you're blowing directly at them? Well, obviously they're not smelling me. That's the, uh, the, the, the thing. It's not that if they'd smell me, they'd run just like everybody else. I'm just keeping myself from being smelled. I hunt from high tree stands, but I, in my new book, I just found a need for people who are hunting on the ground in lower stands that need tactics. So I come up with a whole list of tactics for people to get hyped out of their stands without actually doing it. So um, wind's too deep to discuss here right now as much as I'd like to. And I know there's other questions, so I'll let it go with that. Yes. I actually have a question for Mike. Uh, I just purchased property back in November Mike, and it has Mike, about 20 acres. Mike of uh, open field is starting to regenerate a bit it has some uh, scattered pine trees and some scattered bushes but for for the most part it's open uh, what would be the first step i would do on i just purchased property in november uh so i don't know where to begin on like an open field like you did so well first thing we did is um we got together with one of the biologists one of the local biologists and we kind of devised a plan with him we went over all the different soil types Certain plants will grow on certain soil types and other plants will refuse to grow on those types or will not do very well at all. Say for instance, if you've got a, some wetter areas, maybe some of these uh, speckled alders like you see up over here, or some willows. There's a variety of willows that can be planted, some shrub type willows. Um, some areas, uh, Ed, Ed promotes a good mix of uh, tall grasses and, and he's got some of the grasses get pretty tall and even has uh, food mixed in with the grasses. Those are some good ideas for uh, things that I would recommend buying Ed's food plot book. If you haven't bought that already, I recommend that to everybody as a matter of fact. And I like to uh, do a lot of work with edges on the property. So like we're, a lot of times deer will like to travel along edges where the hardwoods meet the conifers or maybe if you've got some tall switchgrass, something like that. Um, I like to have water sources on the property. It's, the way we set our property up is uh, we got a lot of bedding areas, quite a few, like maybe eight or ten different bedding areas, and then the bucks will move around. I try to, what I did is I stacked the bedding areas in a row. So there's like five or six bedding areas all in a row, and then if you could get downwind, don't let Bill hear this. <laughs> I like to get downwind anyways to these areas and then the bucks will move along in certain areas. I create, uh, one thing we got on our property in southern Michigan is a lot of red cedars. And I'll just grow those red cedars up and then I'll cut them down when they're maybe 15 feet tall. And I'll use them to block areas where I don't want the deer to go. And they'll last a lot longer than some of the other trees. If you just got regular deciduous trees, they'll decay a lot faster with those cedars will stay around a lot longer. And another thing you can do is you put those cedars down and then the regular uh, forbs and everything else, the weeds will just grow up right in between them and they'll just kind of form a barrier. And you can get the deer to travel where you want them to go. That's one of the main things you want to do is get the deer to travel where you want them to go and come past your stands. But there's, uh, yeah, there's just so many things that you can plant. We've gone with, and I would say, uh, don't plant just a single type of conifer. Go with a variety because if you have some kind of infestation with insects or what have you, you're going to have a problem with, you know, maybe all of your trees of one species getting a disease and that could be, you know, catastrophe for your plant. So intermix your, you know, different kinds of trees so you don't have that kind of a situation. And I hope that helps out a little bit. Anything other specific that you want to know? I'd like to, excuse me, Joe. I'd like to say something that um, is testimony to this group of people. Um, before last year, or two years before that, I had never participated in habitat work at all. I met Jake and Jim and uh, was fascinated. 
just absolutely fascinated by it. It's a different way of hunting that I'd ever seen. And so this year, I put two very small micro plots in my backyard, right off to the corner. I've never even hunted in my yard, you know, that much. I have 40 acres there that's all open except for one strip of cover. And that's where I put the, uh, the two food plots. And on my very first attempt this year hunting there, um, the plan was to not house, I made beds, but not to house bucks, to house does. And my hope there was that when the does came into bed during the peak of the rut, the bucks would follow. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. I killed a very nice 140 inch white tail on November 3rd, the day of perigee, uh, the moon being involved, everything that I talked about being in my book all lined up. So it was a real tremendous experience for me. But what was the biggest thing was I had fun <laughs> preparing the gram getting my hands dirty, thinking all these different thoughts and stuff that uh, this guy here taught me, but anyway, thanks, Jim. So Mike um, grew his property up from um, uh, an empty field. Scott grew his property up from an empty field. They planted tens of thousands of trees. I want to encourage people, though, to recognize the value of just letting an, a field go, too. I like to suggest that the first two or three years you kill everything in that field, till it, kill it again, maybe till it again, kill it again, and then see what comes up over the next two years. You could have ash trees and mulberry trees this tall in two or three years. And if you have good soils, you can have all these forbs growing up like goldenrods and giant ragweed that creates just absolutely superb deer habitat. So you don't have to break the bank spending a lot of money. You create a lot more beauty when you do what these guys have done, growing the fruit trees and the evergreen trees and all that. But old fields are as good a deer habitat as exists anywhere. Other questions? Yeah. This is for Bill Dale. Okay. Did you allude to the fact that you have a new book coming out? Uh, yes, I do have a new. Uh, Let me hold it for you, Bill. Yes, I do have a new <laughs> book coming out. It's called uh, Intelligent Predator, and. Um, Basically, what it uh, is designed around is using intelligence to, I mean, I don't know how many of you here are Christians, but I based my book off the scriptures and what they say. And in the Bible, it says there's two great lights, one to control uh, the day and one to control the night. And there are many other verses in uh, uh, the creation verses that harmonize beautifully and it's what conducted my study in that direction. So when I say that I've thought something up, really it's not. It's been my inversion of the thinking that God has delivered to me through his book. When will the book be coming out? Uh, hopefully within one year, because at the last minute I kind of decided to do it like a guy I know that would just come out with a killer book. <laughs> and uh, so it's going to take me a little longer. Yeah. Uh, for those of us that don't have a uh, drill, uh, when it comes to soybeans and corn and you're just broadcasting it, what would be the best way to get it the proper depth? Uh, light tow or drag arrow or this is in a sandy loop? Okay, pretend you're a farmer now. Corn should be in the ground two inches. If you want to do it 100%, then you broadcast your corn and fertilizer and you, you set your tillage tools four inches. The average depth is two inches, and that's the depth for corn. If you're gonna do soybeans, the depth for soybeans should be about an inch and a half. And if you can do soybeans by itself, then you, you till it three inches deep. If you're gonna put sh sugar beans, because I recommend that you really try, seriously think about it, that's what our new DVD is about. It's a blend of corn, soybeans and sugar beets and it's planted early for normal or just it's planted late now let's say you ain't got time to mess around you mix the corn with the soybeans and maybe you got some sugar beets it's all round and ready you mix it all up the corn is no more than seven pounds an acre unless it's cheap corn and you go to eight pounds pheasants forever or something like that it could be two it could be more than two years old you mix it with 30 pounds of soybeans Notice how light this is. And you mix it with uh, sugar beets, roundabout sugar beets, at one-fourth the normal seeding rate. 
not the normal, one third, one fourth, something like that. You mix it all up and you broadcast under you broadcast underground, but you broadcast in fertilizer first because we're doing it all at one time. Till that fertilizer four inches deep. Never go deeper than four inches, or never go deeper than your topsoil, even if it's only two inches. And then when you till all three together, don't till any deeper than two and a half inches. And after you're done, you go over with the cultipacker. Uh, let's see a gym walk. Just take a few steps. That's too fast, slower. That's too slow. That's how fast you, oh yeah, he's showing off. That's how fast you go with a cultipacker. The cultipacker was not designed by a human being. That's about the speed you're supposed to go with that cultipacker. <laughs> how come it's so hard for you to pick that up? <laughs> and you cultipack all three together. Remember, you, 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 you till, the, uh, you till sh the fertilizer in by itself. That's got to be in with the four inch tillage. And then if you put everything together, there's nothing wrong with that. The seeds on the top are going to have a hard time to grow, but if you cultipack, you're squeezing the air out. That's your enemy, air. But go slow with that cultipacker. You know, I, I'd rather go one time super slow than two times fast. And then the stuff that's down deep will come down anyhow. And if you have a good rain right after you, you planted it, you done cultipacked it. That never happened. Uh, you know, when, when some of us, like Bill, go to church, it can happen. <laughs> Nothing ever works farm legends way. Other questions, please? Yes, sir. Off your last statement there on the bare field and tilling it. Right. Off your statement there on the, the field there, tilling it, letting it regrowth. I see often on the, on the forum there that you guys are recommending plethodium, I think it's called? Clepidum. Clepidum. Okay. So, could, you, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, your main enemy in letting a, a, a field go to old field is going to be cool season grasses. And so many people let them go two or three years and they say, my soils are no good, nothing's growing here. And you walk in there and look and it's all these grasses like in this lawn here. And they're matted four, six inches thick. Uh, so seeds can't even get started. If a seed can get started, say a little maple tree starts up, it, it's poking its head up. It's about that big. And by the time, you know, it, it's going to be two or three inches tall, the weeds are going to be up this, the, the grasses are going to be up this high, then they fall over and they mat that down and that maple tree never survives for the next year. So it's really about getting rid of those cool season grasses. So you can go into that field, let it green up, kill it with Roundup, let it green up again, kill it again if you want. Uh, tilling is really great, burning if you can do it, not all of us can get away with burning. Then when it starts to come up, you may want to tune it up. And then from then on, because you're going to have your other kinds of forbs, and forbs are just plant any broadleaf plants that you go on, have going there uh, that, that grow are, are called forbs. So you want to encourage them and encourage the trees. So if it looks like those grasses are starting to recover, that's when you come in with a grass specific herbicide. And clethodum, I believe, is about the cheapest one you can get now. Uh, you can buy it for Rural King and they'll ship it to you for about 70 bucks. Hey, and something, uh, and a good accompaniment for the clethodum is uh, crop oil for Yes. making the clethodum a little more effective. The reason they call these grasses, these cool season grasses, is they make their best growth during the not so hot temperature time of year, spring and fall. And the reason why applications of clethodum are effective in getting greater forb diversity is because in the spring, what grows the fastest, the most the cool season grasses? And those cool season grasses will grow early. They'll grow, before you know it, they're knee high. And the forbs, which may get a later start because they may be, their growth may depend upon warmer soil temperatures than cool season grasses do. They don't have time to get going and get established. And that's why the cool season grasses will uh, totally dominate and cause the forbs not to develop. To Best control cool season grasses, in my observations, it's best to apply it twi twice a year, to apply the clethodum twice a year, once in the spring and again in the fall during those peak times when those cool season grasses are growing the most vigorously. Hey, well, your uh, clethodum, will that take out uh, chicory? No. Uh, 
Uh, repeat that, please. Will the clef clefidum eliminate chicory out of my plot? No. Uh, are, are you asking if glyphosate will, will kill chicory? Clefidum. 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 No. Oh, it's, it, clefidum is grass specific. It will just no. kill grasses. Okay. okay. Uh, just, just to add on to what Dan just said, uh, Roundup, it isn't as great as, you, as people want to say because it kills bacteria. Okay, but well, what's bacteria? Without bacteria, you can't grow anything, number one. Number two, it's okay. Add carbon to the soil because the main uh, food, food for bacteria is carbon. Second best food is nitrogen fertilizer. So you, you can overcome that. That's another story. You want to maintain, you put in a good food plot, you busted your butt, and now you've got a clover field that looks pretty good. Again, always a blend. Add chicory and everything else. And here's what you're going to find out. You spray with Roundup, not the year you plant, not the second year. You spray with Roundup in the spring, think May 10th, May 15th. You have to have moisture in the ground, lots of it. And you will not kill the clover. You not, you not kill the alfalfa. And you won't kill birds for tree foil. And you won't even kill chicory. Third year, a lot of moisture in the soil. And then every year after that, and you can actually maintain a clover field for about 510 years. Wow. Question at the back? Exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, exactly right. Uh, yeah. Is Clefodim a restricted use herbicide? I don't believe it is. What was the question? Uh, is it restricted use? No. You, uh, you mean uh, glyphosate Roundup? No. No, no, no. No, no. He, he, even Dan, no, no permit. with his infirmities, uh, is, is capable of using it. Actually, actually, I bought it at Rural King for $11 a gallon last summer. Yeah, it's really much less expensive Cheap. than some of the name brand grass specific herbicides. Just another comment on food plots and maybe we can move something else. Ed is going to be speaking at, at the back of the property when we do our tour later. So he'll be <coughs> excuse me, talk, talking a lot more about food plots. Um, it, it, I think the biggest mistake people make is trying to get pure food plots. They want to have a pure plot of chicory or clover or something. All, that, all those weeds that are growing up in there, most of them are deer food. And if you go and inspect your plots, you look in late summer, and, and, and um, uh, what am I, common ragweed, yeah, they're hitting common ragweed more than anything else out in your fields in late summer. So these other plants create variety. And I would say if you're doing wooded, uh, you have stumps that you cut out in a food plot, and I hear these people say, kill those stumps. Worst idea I can think of in the world because a deer goes in the food plot and those stumps are going to grow up shoots of maple or what ash or whatever you have in there and the deer's going along eating nothing but clover and go whoa an ash tree uh, so your the variety is so important in these food pots so don't try and get pure don't go for perfection that's for farmers it's not for deer i got a question right here okay back here this one's for Harry jim this one's for jim and mike uh the bean creek co-op that you guys are involved in i see it were very successful last fall is there a secret to getting your neighbors on board? Well, um, I was blessed to have a co-op that came to fruition this year. Uh, I have an article that was in this month's uh, Quality Whitetails magazine where I tell the story of a buck called the Big Six. And it really came together on 380 acres of land, five contiguous properties. Uh, it was uh, along a creek bottom where a buck can go for 1.6 miles without leaving cover or leaving one of three people's property. All of us have spent several years following this buck called the Big Six, who was killed uh, on October 22nd this year. And this really brought our co-op together. Uh, when we started seeing pictures of this, this was a three and a half year old when we first saw him in 2012, six point deer that was about a hundred inch deer. He never grew very big antlers. Uh, the uh, following year as a four and a half year old, he had uh, six points and was maybe 110 inches or so. The next year he grew two little uh, G3s, so uh, he was an eight point when he was killed by my friend Luke. The best deer hunting day of my life when that buck that we had so many pictures of died. And this all came together with just five landowners and most of it happened just on my neighbor Luke and my property. He killed that buck, 
Uh, Ten days later, I killed a 150-inch eight-point that we had never seen before in, in that co-op area. So that um, in just a few years' time, uh, that uh, little cooperative effort, and you never know where it's going to happen. It creates a combination of habitat. And um, um, it, uh, stopping competing with your neighbors. This is a game that we play out in the woods in all these little 40, 60, 100 acre lots where uh, everybody's sitting on their acreage and wondering what the next guy over there is going to kill. The best way to win that game throughout the history of Michigan is to shoot the first antlered buck you see because if you don't shoot him, the neighbor's going to. What Luke and I started to do with our neighbors is we took every single picture we had of these big bucks and we showed them to every neighbor. I especially want the poaching neighbors to see them. I want the people that are killing the little bucks, I want them to know what's out there. And that's how I think that you um, get a co-op to a level where people start saying, my God, we really can kill deer like this on these small properties. That's a cooperative game. Everybody wins. Luke and I, after we each killed our big bucks, had chances to shoot what were shooter bucks for us earlier in the year. And we said, we're stopping at one, we're going to pass these, and we want our neighbors to kill those deer. We hope our neighbors will kill those deer, because if they do, that changes their life forever, just like it changed our lives forever to ch kill our big deer on that small property. So I hope you get a chance to look at that. I will say another thing, he mentioned Mike Hartness. On the day I killed uh, the buck we call the stranger, Mike killed a giant buck on his 50, so I'm on 40 acres. He's on 59 acres. He's not in the co-op, but he's a few miles down the road. And our good friend Jay Killinger on 67 acres, that same day, November 2nd, we all killed trophy bucks on our little teeny properties. That's habitat, habitat, habitat. So it's a combination of habitat and it's cooperation. Uh, Mike has a little bit of cooperation around him. Jake has none around his property, and he's doing it all on his property just the way Scott did here. It shows you the power of gentle persuasion. Yes. Yeah. We do not tell people what to shoot in our neighborhood. We show them what we have available to shoot at the end. beginning of the year. We invite everybody. I don't care who anybody that wants to can look at all the pictures I have because we're real serious about it. And so we take a lot more pictures. We want them to know what's out there. We're not holding it in. You see so many hunters that say, I'm not going to tell you what I got. I'm, I want to keep it secret. That is the wrong way to do it if you want to grow big bucks in your neighborhood. The right way to do it is to, to let those neighbors know what's out there. And then if they kill a deer, call them up and say, hey, I've got a picture of that deer standing 12 yards from my stand. And you want to see it? That kind of persuasion is much better than coming in at the beginning of the year and saying, we don't want you to shoot anything but eight points. We, do, we want you to do a 15 inch spread. Uh, this is a much better way to do it. And it works. Doesn't always work everywhere. I've got 130 acres of superb habitat where I cannot see a four and a half year old, and I've got 40 acres where I expect to kill a four and a half year old. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't work everywhere, but it works over time. Uh, and I expect that that 130 acre property over time may begin to work as well. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good or bad, what's your uh, opinion of multi floor rows? Well, I'll talk about multi-flora rows. Multi-flora rows is what I, I, I have never seen anything uh, that will bring deer out of their beds more. When I go in and hinge cut a woods, uh, if I'm not getting multi-flora rows going, I have to go in back in and hinge cut some more. Uh, and uh, there's no, I've never seen anything uh, that deer will feed on more aggressively than multi-flora rows. So I love it. I, I get I have pictures in my Facebook page of my arms all scraped up. I love it. I love it. I love it. You can cut paths through that, and the deer will keep those paths pruned back if you have a high enough population of them. You just have to establish those paths. You can clear out areas in them. But that will get the doe families. You have these motorflora rows growing in the woods, and you have a bedding area. Those doe families are going to be up every two or three hours all day long feeding on that motorflora rows. And I've got hundreds of hours of uh, video. Uh, that you can see on my YouTube site that shows these deer popping in, in you know, up and, and eating me. So I love multi-flora rows. I'll let somebody else talk about uh, autumn owls. And a actually, there's an autumn owl story on the tour. Dan's anxious for that. Yeah, one of the...
problems you get when you have severe winters like we've had the last couple of years is you get some die off of Baltimore. No kidding. <laughs> and, uh, and, we'll, and there's some evidence of it uh, here on this property. <laughs> I think, you know, my personal opinion, and there are people that, you know, for, work for the NRCS or the uh, DNR that really look upon autumn olive as the great Satan of wildlife habitat. And uh, it can be invasive. On some sites, it's more invasive than other sites. On my property, it's never been a takeover the universe kind of a, a plant. It does provide excellent cover. I like autumn olive because it uh, is something that you can establish if you're planting it from a seedling, which I guess we can no longer do in Michigan. But you can transplant them. But uh, they establish very easily with minimal weed control. They can produce very good cover. The fruit that comes off them is very high in lycopene and, uh, and high in vitamin C as well. And uh, Dr. Stephen Porsche, who's in attendance today, had a, had a great remark about I, the fact that he loves the smell of lycopene in the morning from autumn olive berries. Uh, real quick, uh, I, I want to hear from Mike Hartridge on autumn olives because I've seen all the autumn, autumn olives and what they do to the bucks on his property. <laughs> They're like catnip. Well, I first got started with autumn olives back about 1980. Uh, the Conservation Service was selling them, you know, along with white pines and spruces and whatnot, and uh, we planted quite a bit of those on quite a few of those on my mother's property out by Howell in Livingston County. And I have to tell you, that was a long time ago, 1980, and the deer are still using that area as a bedding area today, right out in front of her house. And then on our Hillsdale property, we planted quite a few of those, and we make, we put rows of them, and then we just have, uh, they all serve as licking branches in the rows, like where you've got uh, short grass or clover right along the edge. If you just, you got the branches about this high, keep them trimmed about that high, and, and the bucks will love to use them as licking branches and, and scrape sites. So they, they really are effective. They're good for bedding areas as well. If you can mix them in with uh, some taller grasses or just let it go natural with the goldenrod. But one of the things about the autumn olives is they're one of the species, like Dan mentioned, that you can plant them and they'll just grow. I mean, if you plant them in a heavy sod, they're going to have a tough time getting set, started. But if you just give them a little bit, you know, spray some Roundup down and, and, and planted those, they'll just take off. We tried some other things like uh, bush honeysuckle, and they were very hard to get established because of all the weeds around. But the autumn olives really took off, and, and uh, they've been a great habitat shrub on our property, I can say that. And they will spread quite a bit if you've got, especially on drier sites. But... Uh, They've been really uh, beneficial for us, I would say. Okay, um, I, a real short comment then, because we're getting ready for the tour. Uh, my feeling about autumn olive is just a bit different than this three esteemed speakers. Uh, this is my feeling about autumn olive. I nominate autumn olive for President of the United States of America. <laughs> it will be an improvement. I uh, second that nomination. I nominate Ed Spinozola as vice president. Uh, we're going to root it. It's going to mess you up good time. We have time for one really quick question. Then we're going to bring Greg Bishop up, and he's going to read you uh, some information about this property. We're going to do a property tour. Uh, one last question, and, and panelists, let's make a quick answer out of it. Do you have a second alternative to Automala if you're not interested in it? There is none, is there, Ed? No. No. What, isn't, isn't there a Russian olive? An alternative to autumn olive. There's Russian olive. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a native plant, right? It's not an invasive. Right. Okay, so um, uh, we, we really have to get going on the tour. Uh, Any more questions they can ask us on the tour? Uh, yeah. These guys are going to be on the tour. Dan will be talking about native grasses and ponds. Ed will be back at the back of the property talking about uh, destination food plots. I have to go to my knees because I just have my surgery. Yeah. I'm just going to be at the table to talk. Bill will be to back here at the table. So you have access to some really great Michigan habitat and hunting experts. And I'm going to hand the mic to uh, Mike Hartness, who wants to stay, say a few words about his friend Scott. I just want to say regarding Scott, uh, 
I met Scott through the Bow site on the computer uh, over 15 years ago. And uh, we bought our property in Hillsdale County in 1993, and I believe Scott bought this property in 94. And every year we just went back and forth and, and uh, talked to each other about everything that we were planting and, and uh, the water that we were putting on the property, the ponds, and uh, what we were doing as far as mixing in different species and the grasses and everything. And I learned so much from Scott over the years, and, and uh, he's taught so many people on the Sportsman Forum so many different things about habitat improvements, and uh, I just miss him greatly because, you know, this time of year we'd always be talking about what we were doing on our properties, and, and uh, he's, he's just a great, great guy, and missed by all of us. Cheers. Quick comment, since the Michigan Sportsman Forum was mentioned, it is the world's best deer hunting campfire. Uh, most of the friends that I'm up uh, working with here today, I met through this campfire. We have the guy who founded that site here. Steve is, is selling uh, uh, goods back there for the Michigan Sportsman Forum. I hope anybody that's here will join and go to that Habitat Forum and you can regularly learn from these guys up here how to do this habitat work. It's, to me, the world's greatest deer camp. It's a warm campfire that we've all, Mike and I met through it, and we've made so many friends through it. So just a plug for Steve and his site. I'm going to turn it over to Bob, who's going to sell these trees. These are memorial trees. Scott Bishop is known for uh, growing speckled alders. He's sold speckled alders over the years. These have a brass plaque with them in memoriam of Scott. And uh, the, all the money that we're going to raise here, every nickel we're raising here today is going to Christy Bishop and her family. So please, please, please reach in your pockets. Who give me $100 for one of these trees right here? $100. I got $100 here. How about $150? $150. $150. Who give me $100?